What do we have here today? It's the Asus Staff Gaming B3600, a gaming focused Wi-Fi 7 router and I paid close to $300 for it. So is it worth the money? Well, let's first address the mammoth in the room. Asus does call the B3600 a Wi-Fi 7 router, but there is no support for the 6 GHz radio and just like some Xiaomi routers, such as the B7000, they did implement multilink operation. Technically, it's enough to be able to call the TUF Gaming B3600 a Wi-Fi 7 device, but I'm fairly sure that it will confuse a lot of people, which will get the router expecting the 6 GHz radio. So, for this reason alone, I would just keep the existing router and get something like the U7 Pro if the 6 GHz radio is that important. Anyway, the multilink operation is a very cool feature that can help improve the bandwidth and the throughput, but it does require compatible client devices. And if you have been following my journey towards getting a stable performance from the existing PCIe Wi-Fi 7 adapters, then you know that we're still not there yet. Hopefully the issues will be addressed in the next couple of months, that's the promise we get anyway. The TUF Gaming B3600 also supports the 4K quad modulation, the AI mesh and there is just a single 2.5 gigabit port. There are also the usual gaming features and the Smart Home Master which I haven't tested before so it would be interesting to see what it can do. Let's also not forget its wings like agility, that's also important. In terms of design, the Asus Staff Gaming B3600 apparently took inspiration from drones, which is a bit odd from my point of view, but at least it explains the two ears or wings, which don't really serve any purpose outside the pure aesthetic value. The device is fairly compact and it has four non-removable antennas, but it's still possible to replace them since the joints seem to be identical to what we find on other routers. What I found a bit curious was the decision to almost completely hide the LED lights. So if you want to check the status of the router and that of the network, you do need to raise the router a bit. I don't really find the LED array ugly, but the designers seem to not be fond of them. On the bottom of the TAV B3600, we can see the four silicon feet and two holes that allow the option to wall mount the router. But now let's talk about the ports. We get four LAN ports from which the first can function as a gaming port, while the fourth can be used for a secondary WAN connection. All four are gigabit only. The 2.5 gigabit port can be used for both WAN and LAN purposes, and for the price tag of the router there should have been at least one other 2.5 gigabit port. Anyway, farther to the right there is a USB 3.0 port, a DC in port followed by a power button, the WPS button and the recess reset button. In terms of heat management, Asus rarely misses, so it made sure that the passive cooling is well done. There are openings all around the case, including at the top, rear and the bottom sides. And as you can see from the video that I took using a thermal camera, there are some warm spots which is normal considering the heat transfer away from the chipsets, but there doesn't seem to be any risk of any future thermal throttling. I already opened the TUF Gaming B3600 router in a dedicated video, so know that it's fairly easy to do so, but there are a couple of aspects that you need to keep in mind. First, there is a warranty seal which can void the warranty outside the US, so be careful with that. Then, know that the plastic latches can break when detaching the top part, so be as gentle as possible, especially not to leave any marks because, again, you're most likely going to void the warranty. That being said, the PCB is fairly small, those two ears don't really have any purpose, as I mentioned before, and there is a single chipset for both the 2.4 and the 5 GHz radios. You can see all the components here, but I will go a bit faster through them, so pause at any time to get a better look. I have also included a comparison table at the end with other similar devices. Now that we have reached the single client wireless testing section, let's talk about the devices that will be used here. First of all, there is a single 2.5 gigabit port, which I will be using for the connection to the server PC. Then I relied on the same laptop equipped with an Intel AX200 adapter, as well as the one that used the Intel 8265 Wi-Fi 5 card. What I did change was that I did not use the Pixel 2 XL this time, but instead I included a PC that relied on a Wi-Fi 7 adapter. If you do want me to return and continue to use the Pixel 2 XL as well, do let me know in the comments below. Now, as for the throughput, we can see that the TUF Gaming B3600 did really well with both the Wi-Fi 6 and especially the Wi-Fi 7 clients. 
reaching very close to 2 gigabits per second with the latter. And that's upstream, but even downstream it's a very good overall performance. We get usable throughput even at 45 feet and closer to 70 feet. Obviously, feet, meters, miles matter little if the signal attenuation doesn't match the one in my house, so I added the following graphic to highlight what you can expect based on the signal attenuation measured at each client level. That was upstream, so now let's see downstream. This way, it's easier for you to get an idea about what you can expect in your own home based on the attenuation you got there. If I were to compare the Asus TUF Gaming B3600 with other wireless routers, it seems to sit immediately below the RTXE 7800 when the channel bandwidth is set to 160MHz. Using the 80MHz width, it's actually the second device in my list, only below the TUF AX4200. Not bad. As always, I have also included a longer term graph to see how the throughput fluctuates over time. Now let's talk a bit about the throughput on the 2.4GHz radio band. Since I removed the Pixel 2 XL, we get the info only from the AX200 Wi-Fi 6 client and the Intel 8265 Wi-Fi 5 device. I set the network to use the 40MHz channel bandwidth and the throughput is very good on both client devices. As expected, the Wi-Fi 6 did better when the signal attenuation was about minus 80dB. And when compared to other wireless routers that I tested so far, the TUF Gaming B3600 falls somewhere in between the GTX 6000 and the Zyxel USG Lite 60AX. For the multi-client tests I use the same devices as before and you can see their specs here as well as the signal attenuation which shows that one device is always farther than the other four ones. The tools remain the suite from the NetHydra developed by Mr. Jim Salter. I will most likely include a better testing methodology in the future, but for now it suffices, since there is a long time until I can afford a proper lab with the tools I want. Anyway, the first test checked how the router handles 5 clients running 1080p simulated traffic. And we see some good things with one Wi-Fi 6 client device which stayed near and below 60 milliseconds all the time. This is how it should be. The Wi-Fi 7 client device did well for about 95% of the time, and I suppose the second Wi-Fi 6 client managed to be decent even if for less than 90% of the time. The two Wi-Fi 5 clients remained beneath 100 milliseconds but very close to this value for about 90% of the time. It could have been better. Now let's see how the router handles 4K streaming on the same 5 client devices. Well now, the two Wi-Fi 6 clients stayed below 100 milliseconds for about 90% of the time, and the Wi-Fi 7 only went above this value for 10% of the time. The two Wi-Fi 5 clients didn't care and showed values above 100 milliseconds immediately, so overall it's not really an impressive performance. Of course, I had to make it worse, so I included in test browsing on all 5 clients, running alongside the 1080p streaming. And the Wi-Fi 7 as well as one Wi-Fi 6 client actually held up nicely, as you can see, both of them staying below 60 milliseconds pretty much all the time. The others gambled their way closer to 100 milliseconds, which is not really ideal. And the intense browsing graphic shows that all 5 clients remained below 300 milliseconds for the entire duration of the test, with the exception of one that went above of one second but only for 1% of the time, so it's negligible. Now let's see if the intense browsing had a major impact on the 4K streaming latency. Of course it did, since now we get above 100 milliseconds almost immediately, with only two clients staying below this value for 75% of the time. Not good once again. It's better to add the Ethernet cable into the mix. As for the intense browsing, one client did reach 1 second for 5% of the time, while the rest stayed within reasonable limits. Then again, most people will refresh the page only after 1.5 or even 2 seconds of delay. Now let's change things up a bit by dedicating two clients for the simulated downloaded traffic of a 10 megabyte file continuously, two for the intense browsing and one for the 4K streaming. The downloading clients did better than expected, but not good enough for the latency to be deemed reasonable. 200 milliseconds is not reasonable. The intense browsing is within the acceptable limits, while the 4K streaming rises above 200 milliseconds, which is not really good. The total throughput for the downloading clients was 529.5 megabits per second. Next, I decided to limit the downloading traffic to only one client, while two handled the 4K streaming and two the intense browsing. That downloading latency really caught my eye. 
it's way better than expected. And if you're not particularly picky, it may even be passable. The 4K streaming latency on the Wi-Fi 6 client was close to 100 milliseconds at the 75% mark, but it got higher immediately, while the other 4K streaming client couldn't really care less to offer a decent performance. The intense browsing clients did good, as expected. Let's now limit the number of clients to 3, one for the downloading traffic, one for the 4K streaming and one for the intense browsing. Curiously, the downloading client did worse than before, the 4K streaming client was a disappointment, but the intense browsing latency was decent. Let's go lighter by downloading a 1MB file continuously, leaving one client for the intense browsing and one for the voice over IP traffic. And all did decently well as you can see from the graphic. The last test involves all 5 client devices, and yes, I did run the 10 megabyte downloading simulation on them. The results speak for themselves. The entire reason why the Tough Gaming B3600 can be called a Wi-Fi 7 router is because it supports multi-link operation. And as I mentioned before, there is no 6 GHz radio here, so the aggregation happens only between the 2.4 GHz and the 5 GHz radio bands. But there is some good news, as well as some bad ones as well. The good news is that ASUS has made it relatively easy to enable the multi-link operation. The first requirement is to enable the Smart Connect feature which will create a single Wi-Fi network for both bands and then from the advanced settings we need to go to wireless and choose MLO. If you don't see this tab, make sure that the router is updated to the latest firmware. If you do see it, then enable the multi-link operation and wait for the router to reboot. As you can see, there are some striking similarities between the VLAN and the Guest Network Pro implementation and the multi-link operation interface layout. There's nothing wrong with recycling, although it seems that the VLAN is not supported here. In any case, we do need to create a new multi-link operation network and since I had to run some tests here, I made sure that it's on the same subnet as the main network. You can set it to be separate, block its access from the intranet, and more. It's pretty much the same as the Guest Network Pro networks. After that was done, I connected the Wi-Fi 7 client device, he used Windows 11 with the still experimental version of the 24H2 update, and I could see that the aggregated link was detected. The netsh command confirmed this as well, so I ran some iperf tests. But something was wrong. The throughput was the same as when I used only the 5GHz network. It could be a signal issue, so I used the vStumbler tool to better understand what's going on. I could see that there were two multilink operation networks, one for each radio band. But what settled things for me was when I increased the distance between the client and the server. Immediately after the signal attenuation was higher on the 5 GHz radio, Windows saw that I was connected to the 2.4 GHz radio only. And the throughput confirmed it as well. This is just smart connect in action, no multilink operation. I also used the Linux computer running the kernel version 6.11 RC6 and using the Intel B200 I got the same performance. I still cannot test the multilink operation. I will retest the Asus Gaming Tough B3600 as soon as the stable update version for both Windows and Linux are released. At this point I usually test the LACP aggregation using a TrueNAS that I built, but the B3600 does not support it, so I move straight to the Dual One. To set it, go to the One section and choose Dual One. Then enable this function and choose which port will be the primary one and which one will be the secondary one. Know that it is possible to use USB dongles as well. I used the failover mode with failback enabled as well and pinged two hosts at the same time. Then I disconnected the main WAN connection. It took quite a bit until the link switched to the secondary WAN, about as long as when I tested the AXE 7800. Then I reconnected the main link and disconnected the secondary WAN cable. It took a lot less to move to the primary WAN, so there is a sort of preference system in place. I also wanted to check the power consumption of the router and to do so, I relied on a smart relay and you can see from their dedicated app about what to expect from the BE3600. Note that this value was recorded while the router was functioning normally, not in a higher load than usual. Ok, now let's talk about the web-based interface. The layout is the same as with other TAF routers, there is that black and yellow color palette and the settings are again divided into general and advanced. I noticed that the guest network is the same as what Asus called before the guest network pro on other routers, so we get the option to create networks dedicated to a specific type of application, such as VPN, multilink operation, IoT and even a kid suitable network. I guess the pro is missing because there is no VLAN to accompany it. 
The AI protection remains more or less the same, covering a wide spectrum of prevention and detection systems. They're still powered by Trend Micro, and that does include the parental controls, which require the web and apps filters to control what's being served from the web in your network. Some gaming features are present here as well. There's the Game Boost suite, which includes device prioritization, the mobile game mode, which is again a form of device prioritization, and lastly we get the Open NAT. We do get a dedicated section for it, that includes game profiles for specific games, where the router adjusts the prioritization system to favor a better gaming performance. We also get a decent quality of service system as well, where we can choose the type of application that will be pushed at the top of the priority list, as well as a fairly comprehensive traffic analyzer. The advanced settings remain just as comprehensive as on other ASUS routers, but we do get the multilink operation function under wireless, and that's besides the incredibly in-depth professional section. I did mention that the LACP support is gone, but we do get the dual one, which should not be confused with one aggregation. And I also saw support for Amazon Alexa, which I hope nobody uses. There is of course a mobile app as well, and it's the same layout as what we're accustomed with, it didn't receive the expert Wi-Fi treatment yet. On the home page we get to see some status info which does include data about the AI mesh and you also get a quick link to the mobile game mode. Under devices we can make some quick changes to the router and we can also configure the quality of service on separate clients. The family section remains comprehensive enough and under settings we get access to the rest of the features. I did not mention the VPN support yet, so know that you can use PPTP, OpenVPN, IPsec and WireGuard as well as the VPN Fusion and the IPsec Core Instant Guard. So, should you get the Acer Staff Gaming B3600? If it costs anywhere near or above $300, then absolutely not. It functions well as a Wi-Fi 6 router, the throughput is good, the latency fairly decent up to a certain point, and we do get lots of features. But as a Wi-Fi 7 router, it's still a bit too early for multilink operation. And I assume that's the case for the large majority of people. If you have the latest hardware, then you're set. The problem remains the cost of the router, because I have tested the Xiaomi B7000 a few months back, and it has a similar approach to what Asus did with the B3600. But that router costs less than half, so I'd say wait a bit because I have a feeling that the price will drop very soon to where it should have been from the beginning.